very dear to my heart. This is not just a history class. This is not a class about one superhero. It's much, much more than that, inshallah. And before I start, I just wanted you to notice one thing, the name of the class. I know that like when we speak about this class, it's what's the name? Salah al-Din al-Ayubi, right? And the class is not about Salah al-Din al-Ayubi really. And there is a problem when we make the class about one man. Why? Because we, we, we can learn about Salah al-Din al-Ayubi, a great man, not only a great knight and a great warrior, but a great scholar, a great worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a really chivalrous Muslim. Very, you, you, it's, he's like inspiring. But then what happens is the following. We think that what we're missing today is the superhero. That Salah al-Din is a superhero that emerged from somewhere. And then when he emerged, he saved the Ummah. You get it? And when we teach this way, then we are waiting for the superhero to come and lead us to victory. And this method of teaching is very dangerous because this is not true at all. As a matter of fact, I can tell you, if Salah al-Din shows up today, what do you think will happen? We will revolt and bring him down. And you will see this is what really happened also in the past. It's not a one-man show. It was really a whole generation. Salah al-Din is a representative of a whole generation raised by scholars. He was great, but the men around Salah al-Din, the women around Salah al-Din, the old and the young, the knight and the scholar, they all gathered together, united, and they are the ones that recovered Jerusalem for the Muslims. So it's not a story of a one man. It's a story of an entire generation. Of which one man, Salah al-Din, was a representative. Right? So therefore, the title, as you can see, of the class that I like, is not Salah al-Din, the generation of Salah al-Din al-Ayubi. And it's not the knights, the scholars, the, the ones that fight the, the battlefield, the, the, the great warriors. The knights and the scholars. Who taught Salah al-Din? Who taught that generation? What were this, who were the scholars of that time and what did they teach? How did they see the problem of the Muslims and what did they, what did they do about it? Right? Because we can take the same work and apply it today. So this class is much, much more than just a one man superhero biography of Salah al-Din al-Ayubi. Right? It's much more than history. When we learn history, it's not a, an events line. This battle first, that second battle, that third battle, and that's it. What are the lessons behind it? What was the social state of people? What led to the emergence of such great generation like Salah al-Din? What were their challenges? This is what the class is about. The reason this class is important, many reasons. Number one for me, we live in a time where it, we look like it's so bad and Muslims are so humiliated, we're so helpless, we're so hopeless, we're so pathetic that some people say, I've never, I don't think we were ever like this before. I think we are at our lowest point. And some people, they start to lose hope that we'll ever be something significant. That we're always under the feet of everybody, begging the United Nations, begging people for ceasefire, begging people. That's what we are nowadays. And, and many people look at our reality and they feel depressed. If you're one of those people, this class is for you. Not only it gives hope, but the first lesson we learn today is that if you think today is bad, and if you think we're hopeless, I beg to differ with you. The time of Salah al-Din, before Salah al-Din came, before the Franks, the Crusaders attacked, the Muslims were worse than they are today. We passed through worse times where Muslims were much worse than us today, yet they recovered. So that's the first lesson I, I want in today, inshallah, to impart unto you, right? That look, this is not the first time we're weak. It happened before and it was worse and we recovered. If we recovered before, we can recover again. We just need to learn how. This is the first thing. The second, if I'm looking for a, a, a role model, a superhero for my kids and for myself, that's a very suitable class for that. If I'm looking for a way to change the roadmap, how, how, what can I do? Tell me what as Muslims, we, what can we do in our reality? I want to change things. That class is about this as well, right? As well as it's a, also a history class. So. Before I start the class, inshallah, one uh, thing that I always start with, uh, and uh, it's a, a little bit funny example, but it's a true example, right? Before we study history, before we learn about any human being, the lens by which we look is very important. What does that mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
ولكن تعمل قلوب التي في الصدور. It is not that the eyesight that go blind. It's the hearts and the chest that goes blind. Meaning what? We see things the way we are. This is a very important concept, Islamic concept. You know, we really see things. If my heart is not polished, if my heart is not clean, you can put the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in front of me, because that happened. The Muhammad, you know who Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is? The Prophet of Allah, the greatest man that lived, the one that's honorable, truthful, the one that worshipped day and night the most. There were people that spoke to him, looked to him, and what did they see? Astaghfirullah, an imposter. And the Quran says that. The Quran says, وَتَرَاهُمْ يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَيْكَ وَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ You see that they are looking at you. People are looking at you, O Muhammad. Yet they don't see. They don't see you. What's the problem? It is not that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, is not great, but the heart is inclined. So similarly, whenever we study history, whenever we study about whether it's Umar ibn al-Khattab, Khalid ibn al-Walid, uh, Salah al-Din al-Ayubi, if you go to secular sources, what do you think happens? People in the West, when they look on our culture, they look from their own eyes. So they can never see things really the way they are. You get the point? And I'll tell you one example that's very, it's, it's laughable, but it really happened to me. And this is what uh, yani I, I started the class with. Uh, it happened like 10 years ago or maybe 12 years ago. I was driving, you know, uh, lunch break from work. And I was going to the masjid to pray door, right? Driving, there is a traffic light, it's red. So I stopped the car. And here comes another car, car beside me, loud music. And two girls dressed in a very يعني, interesting way, right? And they're dancing and doing what they're doing. And, you know, so I said, خلاص, يعني, they're in their own world. And I just minded my own business. Then all of a the sudden, they rolled their window down. And then one of them says, Hassan, hi, how are you doing? And I was like, what? <laughs> Who's, what's going on here, right? And then the traffic light, it went green. And the, the car left. And I was like, what was that? You know, I, I don't know who this is, right? But anyway, I don't know. So next day, I'm going to Quiznos Subway to get my lunch. You know, I used to go there every, every day to get my lunch, tuna sandwich. And the girls there, they were the two girls that work at Quiznos. They know me because I go there. And they said, you didn't recognize us yesterday. <laughs> right? Now, what is the moral of this story? Here is my question for you. If you were sitting beside me, right, on that car, and the traffic light stopped, and you saw those two girls saying, Hassan, hi, what would you think of me? A very important question. You know what happens? People will project themselves on others. If I am one that parties every Saturday, right, and I see that, I'll say, ah, I know what you were doing last Saturday, right? I know what's going on here, right? If you know me, a little bit and say, I know this guy, I go to the masjid with him. Maybe he was doing da'wah to them or something. You see, like you try to find a way, right? Now here is the best part. If that was why my wife beside me, what will you tell ladies, you tell me what inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, right? And even if you go and you tell her, honey, you know, you know what those two girls yesterday? I figured it out. No, no, no. They're the two girls that work at Quiznos. You know what's the answer? Is that where you go there every day? <laughs> you get it? So what is that funny example teaching us? We project our realities on others. And this is very dangerous, right? Sometimes we look, but we look from the lens of our own self, our nafs. So sometimes there might be a luminous wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we don't see it. So whenever we study about Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, Khalid ibn al-Walid, Umar ibn al-Khattab, secular sources, be warned. Because they cannot understand and cannot see Muslim. They did not see Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They didn't. They did not see Umar ibn al-Khattab. They did not see Khalid ibn al-Walid. So if we want to read about Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi from a secular point of view, expect it to be what? Uh, tilted. Fortunately for us, right, when we, when we do this class, alhamdulillah, our sources, and this is a very important point, what sources do I use? I use, yes, I use secular sources, but also I rely on Muslim sources. What are the Muslim, why, why is Muslim sources important? Because we were very lucky. When Salah al-Din was living, there were eyewitness scholars. There were scholars with Salah al-Din. One of them was his teacher. Salah al-Din was so much interested in learning. 
and he's busy with the battles every day and night. So he asked one of the greatest hadith scholars, you know, the people that teach Ilm al-Hadith and scholar, told him, please accompany me. Accompany me in all my, everywhere in my battles. Why? Because every night I want to learn. So that, his name is Ibn Shaddad. That great scholar, now he's a scholar, a man that has taskate in nafs, you know, his heart is straight, sees things properly, memorizes the Quran, teaches the hadith. He's the mentor of Salah al-Din. And now he's an eyewitness day by day of what's going on. You see the idea? So when Salah al-Din died, Ibn Shaddad wrote a book. And he called it Al-Ma'athir al-Yusufiyya wa nawadir al-Sultaniyya. The great and rare and excellent history of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. Right? That book is available. It's even translated into English, right? Now that book is very deep because it's from a reliable scholar, one that was there, one that talked to the Sultan. So he does not only tell us the events, you know what he will describe? What the Sultan was thinking, what Salah al-Din was thinking. What did he do by night? What was his, yani what was his worries? He will give us an interview of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. You get the idea? So we have, alhamdulillah, we have scholars like Ibn Kathir, right? Who wrote a book of history. We have tons of scholars that wrote about these events from a Muslim perspective. That will be the source for this class, right? So when we're describing this, I'm describing it from the point of view of who? Not the West, from the point of view of Muslim scholars. That's what concerns me. From the point of view of the people with Salah al-Din. I'm interested to know the, not only yani, uh, the victory of Salah al-Din in the battles, and you'll see that. We have details about the battles, what he did and his techniques and strategy. Very interesting. But also, what did he do by night? What was his dua? When he opened Jerusalem, what did he do? Which ayah did he pick? You know, what was the first khutbah in Jerusalem? Do we have that? We have that. See, this is very valuable history. So that's of interest to me, and I hope it's interest to you. The scholars that taught Salah al-Din, what curriculum did they use? How did they teach him to be this way? He was raised by scholars. I'm interested because I want to raise my kids the same way. You get the idea? So that's what we want to get in this class, right? So alhamdulillah, as, uh, and again, uh, I have some of the books at the end of the class. If, if you want, feel free to come and I can discuss which references for you. I can go through one by one, inshallah, right? So I'll, I'll skip this slide. It's more detailed about the references and the levels of it. But I would say this, what's our intention in this class? When we attend anything, why are you here? What are you aspiring for? What do you want to gain? Right? This is very important to set the intentions right. And one thing that I really liked, the scholar that wrote this book about Salah al-Din, Ibn Shaddad, it's a great scholar. He said something really interesting. When he wrote this book, he told us why did he write this book? What did he want? And of the things he wrote, you can read it, he says the following. When I observed the days of our master, our Lord, Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, and the Muslims and the generation around him, Right? I saw things that are so wondrous that I could not help but reveal. Then he tells us something really interesting, something that I face today. You know what it is? He said, I'm, he's a scholar. He used to tell people about what? About the early generation, about Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Khalid ibn al-Walid, right? And he said, I used to teach people about that and the stories of those great people. When I teach it to people in our time, they used to say what? Ya akhi, this is Abu Bakr. It cannot happen today. This is the time of Khalid ibn al-Walid. No, we don't live, we live in the 21st century, Akhi. It's not like this. And some people didn't even believe it. So what do I mean? If I tell you Uthman ibn Affan, great companion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he comes one night, he's going to pray the night prayers in front of the Kaaba. Allahu Akbar. How many rak'ahs did he pray? He prayed one rak'ah. One, easy, right? How many juz? He finished the entire Quran. What? what? It's like, what did you say? <laughs> it's, it's not one Jew. He finished the Quran, 30 Jews in one rak'ah. Now many of us say, yeah, akhi, this is not possible. I've heard people say, look, it takes uh, one hour to finish one Jews, 30 Jews, uh, 30 hours. It's not doable. You see? I can't even believe it. Till you see people nowadays doing the same thing. Once you see it, you see those things that are written in the books, that people used to say that they're impossible. Ibn Shaddad lived in a such a bad time. Muslims were so far away that he complained about what? When I used to teach about Islamic heroes, I confronted from people that, yeah, it's not possible. 
maybe it's not accurate. It's not our days. Those are the days of the Prophet. He said, till I saw Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi and his generation. I saw from their forbearance, from their worship, from their dedication, that which made me certain. I saw those stories in our books become alive in front of me, embodied in me. They made what I read about true by they gave a living example. The reason Salah al-Din is important. When we speak about Abu Bakr and Umar, and we say this is the golden days of Islam, right? When we speak about Salah al-Din, you learn today, what was the biggest challenge of Salah al-Din al-Ayyub? The Crusaders were a formidable force, extremely powerful warriors, really powerful. It's whole of Europe, numbers, strength, you know, armor, uh, 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 dedication, formidable knights. But the biggest challenge of Salah al-Din al-Ayyub was not the Crusaders, was not the Franks. You know who it was? It was the Muslim Ummah. He spent most of the, his biggest agonies were the Muslim Ummah. He spent most of his time unifying, teaching, educating. It required tremendous patience and clemency. And you would see the amount of frustration is, um, and that's why he's great, he's, it's unbearable. You would get frustrated when you hear some of the stories, right? The biggest challenge that the Muslims faced was not the outside enemy, it was their own selves. And today, it's very similar. We think our biggest challenge is the enemy, that they're too powerful. Wallahi, we don't lack resources. We don't lack manpower. We don't lack intelligence. We don't lack, but we are the problem, right? So that's another part we need to learn in this class, inshallah, as we go. Uh, so the way I'm going to start this class, and uh, again, uh, we all want to jump and look at Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi and the liberation of Jerusalem, which is, I think is amazing, right? But I will not do justice to this man. I will not do justice to this generation if I do not speak about what happened before him. The biggest challenge of Salah al-Din and this generation was what? The way the Muslims were before the Crusaders came. When the Franks came, why were they so successful? I mean, I can ask you today, I mean, excuse me, when you look at it, it our situation, Israel is that big. You have Egypt. 120 million people, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, and just, and look at what's, what's wrong. You see the idea, what's wrong? It's not, you have numbers, you have, you have money. We have so much money and we spend, what's wrong? It's the same idea, right? So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to describe the arena, meaning what? Before the Franks came, the hundred years before Salah al-Din al -Ayubi. How were the Muslims? What was our state? And then we will see when the Franks came, initially, the, the initial Muslim response, how it was. And then after seeing that, how did it change? Did it change in one year? Did it change in two years? Did it change? It took a long time. What were the steps? How did it change? That's what we're interested in. So today, the, the warning, this is why I'm, I'm yani, making it a little bit long. We're going to describe the first part. The first part is actually going to be very negative. You're going to see, look, look at the Muslims and man, they're so bad. Look at them. People sometimes get depressed when you do that. But remember, why, why are we doing this? What's the intention? With one thing, if we were that bad before and we recovered, then what should I say? I say Alhamdulillah, we are not as bad and therefore I should become what? There is definitely hope. Do you get the idea? So as we go through this and you see the Muslims and what happened and what they did and you become, I didn't know that, that's frustrating. What I want you to think about, Alhamdulillah, we're not that bad, right? So please, I don't want to, yani, to cause more depression. That's the idea, right? right. So let's now, inshallah, uh, go into the line of events and you know what was going on. So first, the arena. As you know, when we speak about Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi and the Franks, it's centered around Jerusalem, Palestine, right? So by default, the, the, the area of interest is what? Is this area, which includes Egypt, Hejaz, Iraq, Syria, you know, the Middle East, the heart of it, right? So this is where the events are going to happen, right? So if, if we look at it, and just again quickly, uh, one century before the Franks, one century before Salah al-Din al ayyubi how were Muslims? One day, the Muslims, it was the greatest empire. They ruled all the way from Morocco, from Spain all the way to China. One nation under one Khalifa. 
the golden days of Islam. And what, what Khilafah was that? That was the Abbasi Khalifa. The Abbasiyin, right? Where is their center? Where is the center of the golden city, the Khilafah city, the greatest city of the time was Baghdad, right? So in Iraq, Baghdad was the capital of, and it was known worldwide. This is a glamorous city, city of knowledge, city of technology, city of ilm, you know, city of power and strength. Muslims ruled, right? And you had people like Harun al-Rashid and the Abbasi Khilafah was at Zenith. But before Salah al-Din, things changed. The Abbasi Khilafah was extremely weak. It was actually now divided. The Khalifa is no longer the most powerful man. The Khalifa is only has power over his palace and his castle, right? Baghdad itself half destroyed thugs and thieves. You know downtown Los Angeles. You know what I'm speaking about when you have gangs and you know. And you would hear Muslims from that part burn that part. You know the Shia, the sectarian violence. The Shia of one district went and burned the masjid. A lot of violence. It is not safe. There is a lot of thugs, right? The city is kind of ruined. And politically, what happened? Different districts started to separate. This is the first sign of weakness. So the first thing, North Africa and Egypt separated completely from the Abbasi Khilaf. Egypt became independent. And gradually, the area of Syria, you know, today you have Jordan, Syria, Lebanon. Back in the day, just Syria was 22 different nations. So Damascus is by itself. Aleppo is by itself. You know, cities were now nations, right? 22 by itself. So a lot of separations, right? And then something even worse happened. And this is the first thing that we need to learn about a little bit, right? Be beside that they were so divided, right? A major challenge happened in the Muslims uh, of that time. A rise of a new sect. This is a challenge, not a political, not a, an army. It's a new ideology. A sect, the Ismaili sect appeared at this time. They call it Al-Fatimiyin, al Al-Dawla al Al-Ubaidiyya, al Dawla al We call them the Ismailis for this class, right? So what is this Ismaili sect? They would claim we are Shia. No, even the Shia of our days, they tell you they're not from us. It's that clear. So what's, why are they so deviant? Well, they claim we have the Imam the, of the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But here is a part of their creed. Our Imam knows the unseen. Our Imam is the light of Allah on earth. Our Imam is the reflection of Allah on earth. And some of them, Astaghfirullah, I met one personally. I met an Ismaili personally that, Astaghfirullah, he showed me a picture of their Imam today. He said, here, look. And I said, and he said, do you know who that is? And I said, who? He said, that's Allah. Astaghfirullah. So like, I'm, if, you, if that's your belief, I'm sorry, you have nothing to do with Islam. I have no problem saying that. Right? I don't make takfir. But when somebody says that, this is way off, right? So they, the dangerous part, they believe that their imam, and it varies. It, not all of, some of them believe the imam knows the unknown. The imam knows the unseen. The imam has all the knowledge of all the books. Therefore, you don't need the Quran. The Quran was for the Prophet. We have the imam. The imam will tell us what to do. You don't need fiqh. So Muslims, we pay zakah. What's our zakah? Two and a half percent. Well, the imam changed it for them. Their zakah is not two and a half percent. It's twelve and a half. And here is the most interesting part. When we pay zakah, who do you pay zakah for? Uh, yeah, we have al-masakin wal fuqara al-amilin alayha al right? We have categories. No, 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 no. They have only one category. Who's that? The imam, you paid for me. You paid for us. <laughs> Do you understand how, they, when you give yourself authority to legislate, do you see how dangerous that is? The deen starts to change. You pray five times a day. You don't need to pray five times a day. Pray three. He started changing things. Even with the Quran. They tell you, well, the Quran has two meanings. There is the outward meaning of the Quran, and there is the batini, inward meaning. What do you mean? They, they put a dictionary. If the Quran says Al-Kaaba, the inner meaning is Ali ibn Abi Talib. If the Quran says an nar Hellfire, no, no, the inner meaning is to be ignorant of the knowledge of the Ismaili madhab. Now go read the Quran. Do you see how dangerous that can become? Right? So this is, and again, they believe that their imam is, is everybody and he knows and, and he should unite people. They succeeded in taking control in North Africa. Right? And of course, what they did in North Africa was terrible. 
they are scholar, they were enemy to anyone who, who you know, that you're Sunni and you start saying, I'm going to follow the Maliki Madhab, you'll be thrown in prison. Scholars are the enemies of the state. You don't need Imam Malik and you don't need the Shafi'i, you don't need those things. So this, one of the things they did even, and subhanAllah, this is just so terrible, they forced scholars, scholar, if you're a scholar, on your house to write the ins, write statements to insult Abu Bakr and Umar and Aisha. And not only that, they would get uh, animals, you know, uh, cows and what have you, they would take the heads of dead animals, hang them, and then write the names of the Sahaba under them. So they curse Sahaba publicly. Salat al tarawih banned. No tarawih. Forget, uh, you know, you want to go to the masjid to learn? Banned. Scholars are not there. The adhan, they changed the adhan. They were just going. And can you imagine this ideology took power in North Africa? The worst part is that they were aspiring for more. Eventually, they went and they took Egypt. Like, so if we go back, Right, they started in North Africa, and then they started moving. Egypt is a big country, big Muslim country. Egypt fell to the Ismailis. And many Egyptians, I'm an Egyptian myself, right? We don't know this. What is the biggest Islamic institution in Egypt? Al-Azhar, right? Who built Al-Azhar? Al-Ismaili built Al-Azhar. Why did they build Al-Azhar? And I want you to see how dangerous it is. This is not a military force. They want to do what? So I want to spread my madhab. So they started preparing dua and they used philosophy. They studied, you know, logic and philosophy, Greek philosophy. So they became what very articulate in there. And they started preparing da'wah basically. And the Azhar, the biggest, you know, Islamic institution in Egypt now is what? The Ismaili, Ismaili University. So they prepared scholars to, to, to propagate their madhab in the ummah. They're the ones that built the capital of Egypt. What's the capital of Egypt? Cairo, right? What's the name in Arabic? Al Qahira. What does Al Qahira mean? Right? You know the name of Allah? Al Qahir, who Al Qahir, Qahir is what? Irresistible. Right? You cannot. Al Qahir is one that overpowers, irresistible. So the story of Cairo, those people believed in astrology, which is, of course, haram. You know, like the, the stars can tell you the future, you know, this stuff. So they went to astrologists and said, We want to build a city that will never be conquered. And those astrologers told them, there is this star called Al-Qahir. If you build a city in this place at this time, when this star appears, the city will be irresistible. And there's the, they're the ones that actually built Cairo, right? So they took Egypt, they, they stayed for centuries in Egypt. And what, what do you think happened to the Egyptian people? If you live for two centuries under such kind of dynasty, what, what do you think, you know, what do you happen to my kids? No. It's confusing at least, right? You become really confused, right? So the worst part, they didn't stop in Egypt. They started looking for the next thing, Shem and, and Hijaz. So if I go back, okay, you took Egypt. They started going to the area of Shem and then eventually they wanted Mecca and Medina. You think the Ismailis took Mecca and Medina? Yes, they did. They did take Mecca and Medina. And I want you just to imagine that. And one of the worst things that, yani, worst things that happened in the Kathir documents, this just, and I know it's shocking, but it's just the reality, right? They themselves started fighting within each other, right? And in one year, a group of them, by a man that claimed that he's their Imam, his name is Abu Tahir al Janabi, Ibn Kathir narrates this in the Bidaya and I'm not getting it from, he attacked Mecca. Mecca is like Mecca, right? So he attacked Mecca. He went to the Haram. He found pilgrims, you know, hujjaj around the Bayt al-Haram. So what does this man do? He starts killing everybody around the Kaaba. And then he says the following, astaghfirullah, and I want you, like, the statement is just so shocking. He says, Aina al-tayru al-ababil, Aina al-hijara min sijil. You know what he's mocking? Where are, the, where are the birds that throw, you know, Abraha? Where? Where? I don't see anything happening, right? And then he says the following, astaghfirullah, Ana Allah, Ana Ana, Ana uhi nas wa afnihim Ana. I am Allah, me, me. And I'm by Allah, me, me. I kill people and I let them live, me, me. He killed the Hujjaj and he threw their body in the well of Zamzam. And it didn't end up there. The black stone. He took the black stone out of the Kaaba and carried it to his city. The Kaaba remained without the black stone for 22 years. There was no Hajj for 20 years. 
are we that bad? You get my point? Or, or did we reach there? Alhamdulillah, see, Alhamdulillah, right? We're much better than this. This was the situation, right? We don't, did you have people like the Ismailis saying, Ana Allah, Ana, Ana? We don't have that. We have tyrant rulers, yes, right? Definitely, but not that type, right? This is how bad it was, right? And then eventually the Ismailis, their final step was what? Okay, we took Hijaz. Ah, Baghdad. If we can take Baghdad, the capital of the Sunni Khilafah, that's it. And indeed, their, their dua started talking to one of the wuzara in Baghdad, right? His name is Al-Basasiri. It's not important to remember the name, right? So eventually what happened? Al-Basasiri, this, this man in Baghdad, makes a revolt. He removes the Khalifa. He kills the, the other wuzara. He takes power of Baghdad. And it's, the Ismailis seem to have been, it's about, it's, that's it. And Ibn Al-Athir, when he writes it, says this is a dark year because Islam was like, it's gone, right? Fortunately, a new hope emerged at this point. It looks so bad, so dark, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Muslims a new hope, a new hope, a new group of people, new converts to Islam. They're not Arabs, they're not. Exactly. So a new power came to, to like, you know, came and they, they were more towards, you know, um, um, uh, modern day Turkey and uh, modern day, you know, uh, Khurasan, this area, they come from there, right? Turkish origin. The Seljuks, those were new converts to Islam, but very zealous Sunni, and there is adamant about defending Islam. So when this happened, they could not allow that. They came, they intervened, they took Baghdad back, put the Khalifa in power, but the Khalifa was what? A puppet now in their hand. And the Seljuk Empire emerged. And the Seljuk Empire now emerged as what? The, 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 the force against the Ismailis. You see what's going on? Now, the seed of hope that I, I, have, I have to stress this, the man that is responsible indirectly to the appearance of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, the man that really his effort saved Islam for centuries, appeared in that time. He was not the ruler of the Seljuk. This is the wazir, and this is a, please remember that name. We don't know about him, but this is a great Muslim figure, Nizam al-Mulk, the wazir of the Seljuk empire, a man by name, name of Nizam al-Mulk. They describe Nizam al-Mulk not a regular, as a strategist, A1, as a builder, A1, but he was pious and righteous. He loved ilm, he loved scholars. He was really passionate about reviving the Muslims. So he did something other rulers didn't. Yes, the Seljuks were powerful. They had a powerful army. They took back, you know, Asia Minor. They took back Sham. You know, they, they fought. They were even fighting the, the, the Christians in the time. They were powerful, you know, tribes, strength. But he saw that this is not a military fight. The Muslims are defeated internally. And that the Ismailis have Al-Azhar. And the Ismaili is spreading their creed. And the people are confused. So he, in his long-range plan, he said, the start of reform is what? Schools. Schools. So he, he divides a strategy. In every single city, Naisabur, Baghdad, you know, all the big cities, he would come and build Big, huge schools. And in the school, he would do the, it's not only a school, school, dormitory, kitchens, hospitals, pharmacies. It's like a small city, right? And if you want to study, there is, guess what? There is funds for you, there is scholarships. Anybody who wants to study under Islam comes to me, the state will sponsor that. And then he came to the scholars of the time. At that time, it's Imam al-Juwaini, al Qushiri, great scholars of their time, the top two, right? And he got them. and he established the biggest Nizamiya school in Baghdad and he put them in power there. Now, something that happened, and again, this is a very important thing. Uh, there was this man, right, a righteous person who had two kids, Muhammad and Ahmed. And the man is righteous and he is getting old and about to die. So he told one of his friends, I'm going to die. Take care of my kids. I want them to be good Muslims. Here is my money. Take care of them. The man passes away. His friend, very sincere, takes the money, starts raising the kids well, but he runs out of money. And he says, I don't know what to do. Then he goes to those two kids, Muhammad and Ahmed, and tells them the following, I want you to be good. I, your father wanted you to be good. I ran out of money. We have only one solution. Why don't you go to the Nidamiya school in Baghdad? They will spend on you. They will give you like, you know, you allowances and you'll be well taken care. And they will teach you Islam as well. 
Now one of those two, Muhammad, he turns out to be Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Ahmad, Imam al-Ghazali. Imam al-Ghazali appeared where? In the school. The importance of Imam al-Ghazali. See, people don't understand, and they, we, I'll show you a slide. We have to understand each scholar, what time frame he lived in. The challenge for Imam al-Ghazali was, it was a time of what? Utter confusion. Now he was in the school, and he was such a bright student, eventually he becomes the dean, you know, the head of the But he did two things that are very powerful. The first thing that Imam al-Ghazali did, he started looking and the Ismailis, you know, the Ismaili creed and Ismaili books, right? And he read about it and he, he really understood it well. Then he wrote a book called Fada'ih al Bataniya, the scandals of the Batani, the Ismailis. That book became the foundation that the Sunnis took to combat the Ismailis. So he laid what? He, he, he looked at what is confusing Muslim ideologically, the Ismaili madhab, right? So he studied it and provided a solution for that and a, a response. Then he went to what philosophy? Because it was in that time, man, philosophy was, and people use philosophy to go to the unseen, which is not right. And it was such a big movement. And the scholars of Hadith couldn't confront it because they're so logical. So Imam al-Ghazali studies philosophy, writes a book called what? The Intent of the Philosophers. And the philosophers were so happy. Imam al-Ghazali is one of us. And then he writes another book called The Incoherence of the Philosophers. Right? And that was a major blow for philosophy in the time. Ibn Rush did respond. There is a response to it. But like that, so Imam al-Ghazali appeared for what? He's, he, you can see what Nidham al-Mulk did. He started to correct the ideas of the time. A new generation of scholars were starting to develop in those schools, right? We'll come to what happened with Imam al-Ghazali later, right? Type. This is another thing that happened in the time that people find it in interesting. A subsect formed. You remember the Ismailis? A sect of the Ismailis appeared at that time called the Assassins. You guys know the Assassins Creed and what? The Assassins are real, right? The name in Arabic, as you know, it's not the Assassins. The name is al hashashin which means what? What's Hashish? Marijuana, right? Drugs, right? So what is this Assassins? Assassins is, the founder is a man, you don't have to remember the name, the man, Al-Hassan ibn Sabah, right? And his tactic was very different. He said, look, I don't need a full army when if you're against me, I don't need a full army to attack you. No, 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 no. He had a different technique. What is his technique? I would raise Assassins. What do you mean? He would take kids young of age, take them and start giving them hashish, right? And he had this uh, fort called Qala'at al-Mawt, you know, uh, the eagle's nest, if you will. And behind it was, was a valley. And what he did is something really wicked. He went to this valley and started making artificial rivers of uh, milk, rivers of honey, trees, right? And he would go to the kids and deprive them of their dose. And then they would like, we want our dough, you know, we want the, uh, it's a withdrawal symptom, right? The drug. And they would tell the kids, make dua for Al-Hasan ibn Sabah, your mawla. And he would respond. And the kids would go make dua for Al-Hasan ibn Sabah, and then they would give them an overdose. They zonk out. They carry them to this garden. The kids wake up under the effects of drugs, and what do they see? <gasps> What's this? What am I? And it looks like, this is amazing. This is so nice. They drug them again, carry them back to their cells. They wake up, and they tell them, you see, you made dua for Al-Hasan ibn Sabah, you are in Jannah. You get that? It's brainwashing. You take a kid, you start brainwashing, brainwashing, brainwashing. Then they train them in the arts of assassination. And here is the most dangerous part. They send those assassins telling them, pretend. Some of them would go pretend to be a sheikh. Some of them would go pretend to be a priest. They would stay in a church. Some of them go present, pretend to be a, a, a warrior. Salah al-Din did face the assassins. And I'll tell you one story. Salah al-Din, the assassins did try to kill Salah al-Din Ayyubi. As a matter of fact, Salah al-Din had a scar in his face. That scar in his face was not from the crusaders. It was from the assassins. And when they did that, he started attacking them. And one of the stories that, you know, when he was starting to, they sent someone to negotiate with Salah al-Din. So the, the assassin entered and Salah al-Din had his personal guards, because that's an assassin, right? Standing beside. And the man looks at him and says, tell your guards to leave. I need to discuss privately with you. And Salah Din says, no, no, no way. I know who you are. Those are my personal bodyguards. I raised them, so I trust them. You can speak in front of them. 
the assassins does the following, looks at the two guards and says, now, the two guards of Salah al-Din take off their swords, points it to the neck of Salah al-Din al-Ayubi. Do you get the idea? Those are my men disguised as your. And then he tells him, see, you're under our grip. Their method is what? If you do not stop, I'm going to kill you, your family, and all your commanders. You get the idea? So their method is what? If you have an opponent, you don't fight in the battlefield. You go get rid of the, the leaders one by one. And do it in front of people. Their favorite way of killing people was what? In Jum'ah prayer, in front of everybody. Who was their first, unfortunately, target? Who's the man that's standing against the Ismailis? I was thinking Imam al-Ghazali. Allah, alhamdulillah, spared Imam al-Ghazali because he's the one that wrote the books. See, if you're a sheikh and you're speaking against them, and you'll see it, that's what they will do. Right? So it was Nizam al-Mulk, the wazir of the Seljuk Empire. The one that you fought the Ismailis. He, he, Hassan ibn Sabah sent his assassins. And one day, Nizam al-Mulk, every single day, he used to give 100 dinars charity. But he used to pray all the sunnas. If the adhan happens, he stops what he's doing and goes prays. He loved scholars, right? He was a very righteous man. Fast Mondays and Thursdays. So uh, one day he's going out to give the charity as usual. And he sees some Muslim, you know, ascetics people, you know, people of Zuhd. And one of them says, yes, Sayyidi. And he knows him. So the guards are like, halas. He approaches that man. The man gets a dagger out, poisonous, and stabs Nidham al-Mulk. The last word that Nidham al-Mulk said is that, Wallah, it's amazing, that man. He says, Afaut, Afaut, Afaut. Leave him alone. I pardon, I pardon, I pardon. I pardon. Do not touch this man. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. And he dies. Right? When that happened, what, yani, astaghfirullah, like what, what the Ismailis hoped for happened. After Nidham al Mulk, the, the, the Seljuk empire divided into five different regions, and different people started fighting each other. And the great Seljuk Empire disintegrated in this picture that we spoke about. 22 different nations in Sham, Baghdad by itself, Asia Minor by itself, you know, Khorasan by itself, and they're fighting each other. This was the state of the Muslims when the Franks arrived. Interior problems, and by the way, you read about the eco economics, you know, they tell you people were extremely poor in the time. Egypt, under the Ismailis, was it wasn't one of the darkest times people had to eat cats and dogs in egypt it was that bad they tax them over if you want to drink from the nile river you pay taxes if you're a hajj you know you're going from morocco all the way you're passing through egypt you're a, you're a pilgrim right they'll stop you and tell you pay taxes if you don't pay taxes they'll throw you in the prison it was a tyrant regime in egypt so economically the area was not doing well specifically egypt it was economically in a dire need a lot of oppression much worse than today, right? The reports, when you read, it's just striking, right? So that was the state of the Muslims when the Franks came. Now, when I, when I say all this, again, it's so bad, right? We, I, we, we're not this way, alhamdulillah. And if it's, again, what's, what's my motto today? Alhamdulillah, we're not that bad. If we recover from this, we can recover today, right? But you can see why the Muslims would perform badly. They're that divided. So now let's look. Uh, so this is a summary of the situation, right? You have Egypt under the Ismailis, Baghdad, yes, under the Seljuks, but you know the Khalifa is just a puppet. You had the, the Nidhamiya school, which was like the, the one positive thing that we have. Sham and Asia Minor is divided and people are fighting against each other. And then you have the assassins on top of this. This is how the Muslims were at the time, right? This is the mix. Now, this is also very interesting, and we'll go through this more in details as we go into the class, right? So this is a line, you know, the, the Hijri years, and it's a line of events, right? And you know, it starts, we started today here, year 450 Hijri, Nizam al-Mulk, you know, Imam al-Ghazali, this is before the Crusaders. As the line of events happen, the Crusaders come, this is where Nur al-Din Zinki is, Salah al-Din al-Ayubi, this is where the Mongols come and attack Baghdad, this is when the Mamluks come and, you know, expel, so this is the line of events. What I want to do in this class, as we go through the events, I want to look at what? Which scholar lived where? Do you get the idea? Because there is, if you look carefully, there is a link. Where is Ibn Taymiyyah? What time did he live in? People don't know. Did they, who came first, Ibn Taymiyyah or Imam al-Ghazali? You get the idea? 
So this puts things in order because you'll find out that those scholars were dealing with the problems of their time. That's their problem, right? So what happened, uh, something interesting, it's called the uh, uh, speech of the Pope in Claremont. The Pope goes to Claremont, uh, asks all the kings to come, all the nobles of Europe to come, and gives a very powerful, fiery speech. We have the speech, by the way, and you can Google it definitely, right? What is this speech about? Right? He starts telling them, he starts the following way. He starts praising them. You are the children of Christ. You are the, you're the people that are defending the faith of the Prince of Peace. You are the followers of Jesus. You are the ones that are standing against the, the Muslims in Spain and praises the French. And you are the ones that, you know, are holding the banner of, of the, you know, Christ nowadays. And he gives them a lot of praise. And then he tells them, I have bad news. Terrible news came from the East. The news coming from the city of the king, uh, city of the Prince of Peace. News came from Jerusalem. An unclean, filthy race came to power, speaking about Muslims. And they are killing the Christians left and right. And they are beheading them and, you know, playing with their heads. And he starts giving an image of what? That Muslims are, that the Christians in Jerusalem and in Egypt and in Sham are being slaughtered by the Muslims. And the Muslims are so barbaric, terrorists. The terrorists, the big, big terrorists, right? And he started spreading this picture. And the city of the Prince of Peace, the city of Jerusalem, fell to them. And they're shedding the blood and they're destroying the, the church there. And, and many things, many, many. And, and, and he started being, and people were really touched. You know, when you see the images of people in Palestine, how do you feel? This was the social media of the time. There was no social media. So he started speaking and describing and people were like, <gasps> and of course, it's all lies. Not true at all. Christians and Muslims and Jews lived peacefully together, as we all know. But they did not think that. Right? So he lied to people. And then he said something really interesting. He said, and I know you guys are fighting each other in Europe. And Europe, Europe. if you, if you go to the United Kingdom, you know how the weather is in, in the United Kingdom? You know how gloomy it is? You know how European weather is? It rains and, right? He said, by the way, those Eastern countries, oh, California, the weather is really nice and lots of fruits and very rich, very fertile. Whomever goes there. Whatever you take is yours. You get what he's doing? Because any war needs what, unfortunately? What causes war? Yeah, sometimes it's religion, but many times, as we all know, it's what? It's greed, oil, money, right? And so those kings, they needed another, and they were like, what, what? So if we get, and he said, Any, anybody who gets anything there, it's yours to keep. It's yours. Not only that, I promise anybody who volunteers, all his sins are forgiven, and he is going to go to heavens. I promise that for you. Now, at the end of this speech, what happened? Everybody was crying, because it was so emotional. And immediately, everybody made an oath. We will not rest till we free Jerusalem from the barbarians. The city of the Prince of Peace must come back to Christ, must come back to the church. We will defend our brothers, and the kings promised we will come ourselves. But what happened? One man. He's not a scholar. He's a wise, an admonisher, right? His name is Peter, Peter the Hermit, if you heard about. Very, he's, this is a hermit, but he's very, he gives speeches in a very powerful way. So he starts speaking. And there is a lesson. I, the reason I'm saying this, there is a lesson for us Muslims. He starts speaking to the masses, telling them what? I would use our language. Come, if you bring victory... If you bring victory to Allah, Allah will bring you victory. I'm using our language, right? He's telling them what? If you stand for Christ, God will be with you. If you come under the banner of the church and under the, we have to fight and miracles will happen. Allah will not leave you alone. God does not go. Allah is with us. And if we go, miracles will happen. Nobody can defeat us if we stand united under Christ. You know the evangelists, how they speak. And everybody was so amazed because those people were sincere people, were sincere people, and they were zealous, and they cried, and they gave off everything. People sold their land, bought, you know, arms, and went. And he said, no, 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 no. We win if we're pure. We have to be, have people with no sins. It's our sins that defeat us. Who are the people that have the minimum amount of sins? 
Who? It's not the priests. It's the children. Bring forth your children. The children will lead the campaign. And when the children are in the front because they're pure, miracles will happen. And the walls will fall. And our enemy is going to be destroyed. And God is with us. And don't worry. Tawakkul ala Allah. Right? You know what? You see this, the way? Where is the strategy, brother? What's your plan? Did you train? No. Did you plan? No. I know you're zealous, but you had no strategy. And that's what happened. So Peter the hermit got a massive amount of people with him. A huge, hundreds of thousands. Kids, farmers, untrained, massive, a big mob, if you will. And they marched and they landed in Asia Minor. And at the time, the Seljuk, you know, Albar Salen was there, right? And he got news of something strange happened. We, something out of the book, out of the ordinary. Uh, strange people coming, wearing a cross, you know, the crusader symbol. And we don't know what they're doing. And, they're, and he gathered his forces and he went to discover what? Untrained farmers. Not, uh, not disciplined soldiers, right? They're very sincere. They want to fight. You don't even know how to fight. You're not trained. You have no strategy. And a group of kids in the front. What do you think happened to that? How do you think this ended? Have that. Exactly. What happened is, uh, al Barsan massacred all the, and all the kids sold to slavery. Remember, Muslim rulers of the time weren't perfect either, right? So he had no mercy on them at all, right? It's like, okay, that's great. Thank you, right? He slaughtered all of them. But you know what happened? Something negative happened. Now his impression about the crusaders is what? Do you see what happened? He said, oh, yeah, those crusaders are crazy people. Don't take them seriously. They're just fanatics. And if they come, we'll just go and finish them off, right? And now the interesting thing happened. The real crusade started forming, where the kings of Europe came and gathered from all over, Germany, France, you know, England, right? All 20 different European nations, and they're speaking hundreds of thousands of knights, gathered together and marched and started going all the way, right, to Istanbul. And then they started landing in Asia Minor. And news came to Al Barsalan. Hey, a new uh, crusades, oh, those crusaders are back. And you know what? He was fighting against one of his other uh, emirs, Muslims. And he said, yeah, later, later, I'm busy. Right? Yeah, yeah, we'll deal with them because he's thinking what kids, you know, like before. And then the news came to him. They surrounded your city, Nicaea, and they built siege engines. Siege engines? What are you speaking about? Those are like undisciplined. So he goes to the, the other guy and tell him, okay, let's have a truce till I deal up with this. Then we'll finish our business later. You know, we'll fight again later, but just for now. And it is said he goes and he was shocked. It was not a group of kids. It was the European knights. Hundreds of thousands, well-disciplined group, right? And have you seen a knight before? So you've seen the Crusader Knights, right? They are iron top to full, right? So that was not something we were used to, right? Those knights were a fort of iron. And by the way, like uh, also, and by, by the way, you can feel free to try them on. After that, you can take pictures. I know people love to do that. Kids, yes, you can do that too, right? So we, I have the chain mail, you know, the armor, right? Th this is what you wear under the armor. And I want you to feel how heavy this is. This is not the armor. This is the chainmail, right? And what you wear on, on the head, right? So please come and try it. And the crusader sword, not like the Muslim sword. Right? Right? And I, what? Please come and carry it. You know, because you see people doing this and the, just try do this and see what happens to your hand. Right? So the, the Franks, you know, their sword is heavy and it's about strength. Right? It's not about elegance like, you know, the Muslim fault. It's about extreme, excessive strength. So it, for, for the uh, cell jocks, they were excellent arch, archer, right? But now those guys wear armor, tattoo. It's a different type of enemy that they're, they, we didn't see those before. So El Barsan was so scared. So he decided to surrender the city to them. I will not fight them alone. I can't, right? And the city of Nicaea falls to them. 
And then he runs to the guy that he was fighting. And he tells him, you know what, they're coming. We have to unite and we have to do something so that we finish them off before. I don't know where they're going. You're next. And they agree. So they unite their forces. And the Seljuks had, uh, if you know about them, excellent archer, archers. So they, they would ride their horse. And as they ride, they would like have their bow and arrow. And they, it's like a machine gun. They would spray arrows at their enemy, right? And a wave after a wave and decimate. They were really excellent. And you know, when it comes to like uh, the bow and arrow and archery. So they set a trap. And it was a, a, a place called uh, Doralium, right? Between two hills, right? And they set a trap there. And they waited, right? By the way, uh, I, I remember the first time I did this class, my son was eight years old. And I was speaking about some of the techniques because people wondered those uh, cell jocks, they throw arrows for such a long range. How do they do it? And one of the scholars, a modern day scholar, they, he said the following. They had a bow, you know, the bow and arrow. And they had a special bow. They don't use it with their hand. They would lay flat on the ground, put their feet up, hold the bow with it, and then lay back on their back and pull. You get it? And lift their legs up and pull. And then, so their arrows went so far. So they laid a trap, right? And of course, I said that. And next day, I found my own son. Baba, look, and he's on the ground with his bow. And like, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's okay, khair, bismillah. Right? That's what he remembered from the class. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so they laid this trap. And it is said what happened is as they waited, they saw the army of the Franks coming in. And they started slowly going into the, this area. And they ordered their archers, throw your arrows. And it is said in the beginning, it was effective. They got a lot of the horses and a lot. But eventually, those Franks being sluggish and heavy, but they started organized, making like a wall of iron, you know, with the horses inside and, and their shields up. And they just stood. And now the arrows are ineffective. And they started more arrows, more arrows. But خلاص, they just stood their ground doing nothing. And, and now they were like, what should we do? Should we engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat? Yes, no, yes, no. And to their surprise, they look to the right and they find another Frank Crusader army appearing. They look to the left, another army appearing. They look on what they thought is the Frankish army was the vanguard. You get it? The, just the Muqaddimah. And now they figure out that the army is five times bigger than this and we're surrounded. What do you think the response was? They said, we have only one advantage left. We have one, what is it? The Arabian horse. You know the Arabian horse? The Fra the, have you seen the Frankish horse? It's huge, like a work beast, right? Do you see the, the Arabian horse? Very elegant, very fast. So our Arabian horses are very fast. What do you think they're speaking about? Yeah. So, <laughs> so everybody take and run. What about the infantry? Every man for himself. So sorry. It was a slaughterhouse. In the battle of the Duralium, Muslims lost heavy casualties. And al Salan and the other guy now starts running, telling people what? The knights of Europe, uh, beasts, strong, spreading fear around the Muslims, right? And now news struck everywhere. Who are those people? They, 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 who, where are they going to appear next? And little do we know, they march to the other city, the city of Antioch, a major city. And they lay siege to that city. And I'm going to be quick here, right? I, I, I want to finish today like a certain part. So what happened here is at the time, as you can see in this map, uh, when you look to Shem, there is three big cities. Aleppo, Damascus, the capital, and the Mosul, right? Those three cities were under three different rulers at the time. And the two crazy rulers are uh, Ridwan in Aleppo and his brother in Damascus. And their story is very interesting. They, they're brothers. But what happened when the, this man, called Ridwan, took power? He started killing all his brothers. One of them escapes, takes power in Damascus, right? And for the last 10 years, they have been fighting. Ridwan surrounded himself with the assassins and the Ismailis. So he became known to be a very dangerous man. You don't mess up with this guy because the, the Ismailis are around him and he has the assassins on his side. Extremely dangerous, right? So the guy of Antioch, and I'm, I'm skipping the name, found himself, okay, I, I can't fight them alone. I need the help of other Muslims, right? And I'll go quick here. There we have details, but... So he first goes to the, Damascus, convinces the, the leader there to help him. An army comes out. On the way, they meet um, 
a group of Frankish knights. They were out, you know, uh, foraging for food and stuff. This is not the army. And the army of Damascus stopped. Those are knights. What should we do? Attack, not attack. And to their surprise, this small group of knights attacked the army of Damascus. And you know what happened? This group of knights defeated the whole army of Damascus. It reminds me of 1967, if you know what I'm speaking about, right? So what they ran, ran away. And then he went to, to guess what happened? And I'm going fast. Same story. The army of Elipo comes on the way. It meets a, an outpost of the Frankish, Franks. Frank, they, what happens? They attack. They killed. And what happened in that battle? They were so afraid to be surrounded. So they camped in a place where there are mountains around them. So when they were trapped by the Franks, they couldn't escape. It was a massacre. Right? Eventually, and again, they defeated a third army, but I'm not going to go through the battle. The army of Al Mausel came, and treasons happened. And you know, it was also so three battles the Franks won. And eventually, the city of Antioch fell to them. When the city of Antioch fell, they went inside, every man, woman, and children. Everybody killed. They spared no one. All of those are infidels, they all die. Those are the knights of Europe, right? And now everybody's terrified. What is going to happen, right? And uh, the news, like, it comes, we don't know where those, those guys are heading next, right? You see the idea, like, what's going on? Where are the Ismailis? You know, in all this, right? There is so much military action here. The Ismailis of Egypt, you know what they did in this time? They did two things. The first one, good opportunity. The Seljuks are busy with the Franks, right? It's a good time to send some army from Cairo to take Jerusalem. So that's, that's what's number one. They, an army goes from Egypt, right? Takes Jerusalem back, right? And then they said, Subhanallah, they sent a letter to the Franks telling them what? Congratulations. You took Shem, good. Let's make a deal. You take the cities in Shem, we take Egypt, and we live together, and you're a buffer between us and the Seljuks, good. The response of the Franks were one word. What about Jerusalem? At that point, Muslim realized, oh, that's what they want. Right? Now they realize it's about Jerusalem. Now what happened next is something really interesting. So once Muslims realized it's about Jerusalem, guess what all the cities did here? All, you know, Beirut, Saida. Okay, it's not about me. You want Jerusalem, right? Okay, leave me alone. I'll provide you with guides. I'll provide you with food. I'll provide you. I'll, I'll help you as long as I stay on my seat. You get the idea? Anything new here? It's not me. Please, take Jerusalem. I'm, I'm good in Beirut. Beirut is good. Egypt is a khalas, alhamdulillah, tafaddal, right? They send them, some of them send them wine, horses, right? Just pass, pass, right? On the way, there is a small city by the name of Ma'arra. And the Franks surround the city. The people in the city of Ma'arra, they, we can't fight. So they send to the Franks, telling them, if we deliver the city to you, will you spare us? And the Franks said, of course, if you deliver the city with no fight, we will leave, all of you can go free. And the people of Ma'arra agrees, and they open the gates. The Franks go to the city of Ma'arra. They kill every man, woman, and child. But what happened in the city of Ma'arra was something that is outrageous. By, own, by their own account, this is letters that the Franks wrote to their Pope. They say the following. In the city of Ma'arra, we boil the adult pagans in giant pots. We pale their children on spits of fire and we devour them grilled. Cannibalism. It's, are you, so yeah, today we have a very wicked enemy, but I don't think it's the same, is it? It's not that bad. This is what Muslims, and I want you to understand the psychological damage done to the Muslims. Now their image of the Franks is what? Beasts. Powerful, and they, they eat Muslims. Do you understand like the psychological impact on this? So everybody is terrified. Therefore, all the other cities on the way, remember Beirut, Saida, Akka, Haifa, all that. Khalas, truce, pass, pass, pass. Till eventually the Franks reach the city of Jerusalem. And it was under the Ismailis of the time. And they surround the city. And the, the first day, interesting, again, a lesson, once they reached the city of Jerusalem, the first week, some of their soldiers fanatically started attacking. It is said like they did not even think. They were so zealous, they started trying to climb 
the walls with their hands, right? What do you think happened to those soldiers? All killed. Uh, you can be as zealous as you want. You can be as strong as you want. If you do not have a plan, you'll get killed. There is a lesson, right? Zealousy does not work by itself. But eventually, the Franks built siege engines and they built siege towers. And eventually, the siege towers went to the walls of Jerusalem. And they succeeded in breaching the wall of the city of Jerusalem. And the Franks started pouring inside the city. When this happened, the Jews, were there Jews in the city? Yeah, they were living peacefully with Muslims, under Muslims, yes. The Jews rushed to their synagogue. The Franks went, blocked it, and burned all the Jews alive inside. The Muslims rushed to the Aqsa Mosque, holy place. The Franks went after them with their horses, locked the doors. And what they said, their own account, in the Aqsa Mosque, we killed more than 10,000. Ibn al-Athir says 30,000 Muslims to 60,000 Muslims. Imagine the number one day inside the Aqsa Mosque. They said we had the, the bloods of the infidels were to the knees of our horses. I mean, they, this, and they said we had to stop because the stench was unbearable. That's what made them stop. It was one week of killing. What they did to the kids, what they did, it's just undescribable. The interesting thing is, like, look at the irony. They come under the name of who? Jesus? Uh, let me say, it. who? Jesus, the Prince of Peace? Look, is, in the name of who are you doing this? Do you see the irony? In the name of Jesus, you said that you're coming to fight infidels. Who's the infidel? Do you get what, what the irony? And sometimes Muslims do the same. Because... Those people were so zealous, so upset, so angry, so angry that when it came to time and they were strong, they wiped out with no mercy. Right? And, they, and that, please, I'm saying this because Salah al-Din knows about this. Things change, right? So now they massacred everyone in the city of Jerusalem. It was a holocaust, if you will. A genocide by all means. One week of systematic killing. One of the people that succeeded in escaping, right? Al-Qadi al-Harawi, the judge of Jerusalem. He, ex he escaped and he starts heading towards the city of Baghdad to the Khalifa. He said, that's it. I must tell people. He goes to the city of Baghdad. It was Ramadan, right? He's a traveler, so he's not fasting. People don't know that. So he went to the marketplace and started eating. People got upset. Ramadan, a Muslim violating the, the sanctity of Ramadan. How dare you? Soldiers, guards, you know? And then he said, you are upset because I violated the holy month of Ramadan. And you are not upset about what happened in Jerusalem. And he started, this is a, again, a judge, poetry. Everybody in the marketplace cried. And everybody now, a big mob, is heading to the Khalifa, to the palace. He enters to the palace, the, 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 the Qadi of Jerusalem. Please come in. He walks in, starts poetry that's, subhanAllah, very powerful. Describing the horrors that the Muslims saw. What happened to them? What happened to the ladies and the old men and the young and, and the, 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 yani the animosity of the Franks and nobody there to defend them and the blood and everybody cried and everybody announced jihad. Ah, right. And everybody was boiling. What do you think happened next? Nothing. Yeah, they went to uh, big demonstrations, maybe burned some flags on the way. But nothing really happened, right? W I call this the Coca-Cola Muslim phenomenon. <laughs> it's because what's a, what's a Coke, right? You know, a, a, you get a Coke tin or a Coke bottle, you shake it, what happens? Yeah, it's like, it's a lot of, it's just a lot of mess. It's a mess, but it's nothing serious. It creates a lot of mess. What happens if you shake it again? Same response, right? S same response but really nothing. And you shake it again, same response. After five, six times, what happened? Flat. Now, why am I saying this? I'm, I'm much older than many of the young people here. What's happening is not new. I remember in the 90s, some of my own friends, so upset, rightfully so, because of the massacres that are happening in Palestine in the 90s. And they are leading the, the, the demonstration. The demonst Do you think those people that were leading the demonstrations in the 90s, where are they today? They're not doing anything. Why? Well, they got tired. 91, 96, 98, 2003. 2000. 
You know how many times we have seen this? Don't get tired. It's not a Coca-Cola response. And this is a very spiritual lesson because we tend to do what when we get emotional, we exert all our energy. It's a marathon. In a marathon, you don't sprint strong. You sprint, you will not finish the race. In the month of Ramadan, what do we do? Fast, 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 right? Excellent. And the last 10 nights, what do we do? Excellent, right? Fast. And, and the day of Eid comes, what happens? We are so exhausted, right? And then the day of Eid comes, and what do we do? We have nothing left. And then we're back to where we were before. So spiritually, it's about stamina. It's about doing something. It's not just emotions without actions. The question here was, the emotions are sincere. Why were there no actions? This is the question, right? So what the only action we saw is an army came from Egypt. Egypt comes to the rescue. The Ismailis send an army. The least of it was 20K. The estimate of the Egyptian army was 20,000 to 100,000. They sent 100,000 troops, the Ismailis, right? Against 10,000 Franks. And the battle happens, right? A battle, and this is the, some of the estimates. 1,200 knights, 8,000 infantry, that's the Franks. The least estimate is 20,000 for the Egyptian army. It is estimated that it's more than 100,000. So 10,000 against 100,000. And guess what happened? The battle of Asqalan happens. The Egyptian army got defeated in a few hours. Literally a few hours. And the, the leaders escaped by the sea. A humiliation defeat of the Egyptian army. I want you to notice what's going on here. A defeat after a defeat. How many defeats? At least five. What's wrong? Do you get the idea? Why are the soldiers? It's not about the rulers. The soldiers, something is, do you see the idea? The, the reason I want you to retain this in your head, because when you see Salah al-Din, you'll see something different. You'll see the soldiers are different. And that's the question. It is not just the ruler. You can tell what is the disease that's causing this. What's the problem? That's what scholars are going to deal with. What is leading to this? Not the defeat, the affinity of a defeat. Right? Now the Franks, it ends up. Do you think all the cities that helped them, do you think the, the Franks left them alone? What do you think happened next? Once they took Jerusalem, Beirut, Saida, Tarabuls, Akka, all the cities fell to them. And eventually they got the, this, this picture appeared, right? So and maybe we'll stop here. So eventually this situation happened. The Franks took all the coastal cities, as you see, right? Including Jerusalem. Right? Edessa in the north, Antakya, you know, uh, Akka, Jerusalem. So all the coastal part was the Franks. And again, you had three cities divided, Damascus, Aleppo, and the Mosul. And you know what happened then, next? It's a term that we know nowadays very well for the next 10 or 20 years. Well, let's coexist, two-state solution. Not that bad, normalization. So actually, it did, it did exist. Many of them said, Khalas, it's just a new power. You have this. We have this. It's okay. And they started to kind of balance each other. Now, one, uh, I, I need five more minutes, inshallah. Like, I don't know, should we do this next time? I want to describe the, the Franks a little bit, right? So how did the Muslims view the Franks? Right? This is, and we'll finish by this. Just give me five minutes. Is it okay? Right, and we'll stop here, inshallah. So first of all, when you read about the Franks, it looks like chivalrous warriors, right? Very far from the truth. The Frank people, they were... So let's speak about their science and their medicine, right? So we have a situation where uh, the Franks sent to the Muslims that, you know, we have uh, two cases of sick people. You Muslims have what, what they call doctors, right? Muslims had good doctors. The Franks, their medicine was really bad. So they sent to the Muslim camp, sent a doctor because we have two cases. So they sent a doctor. And the doctor went and they came back and they asked him, what did you see? And he, he told us, it's documented. He said, I'm just amazed. He said, what? He said, they show me two cases. The first case was a knight. And the knight had a wound that's infected. So I said, yes, I know what to do. You know, it's an infection. You need to cut and you need to, you know, clean it. And you know, the procedure, right? I started to do that. And one of their priests came. And then he said, what is this man doing? This alchemist, this magician doing magic, uh, infidel ma ma magician. I can treat him, remove that, that magician out. 
and then he looked and he told the knight the following would you rather live with two would you rather live with one leg or die with two legs and the man said i'd rather live with one leg so he said okay come bring a battle axe hit right there this is his cure right and they started hitting and they said the, the guy said the, the bone marrow splattered and they started hitting and the man bled to death this is their idea of medicine the second case he said was weird a woman comes with you know some skin infection and stuff and they said i realize it's, it's the diet and some so i gave him some you give her some creams and some stuff and regulate her diet so you know inflammation would go away this man comes again said what is this magician doing here i will treat her and then he looks at the woman and says hmm i know what's going on the devil fell in love with her so we need to remove the devil so how would you do that shave your hair and and the woman shaves her hair she becomes very anxious starts eating more the disease increases says oh the devil went into her brain so what's the cure said bring me a knife let me cut her skull in the shape of a cross bring me some salt let me push it in her brain so i get the devil out and the woman dies but the, the, why their idea of science was zero they had no idea about what science or medicine is right so it, it was they're very barbaric in their nature right so muslims describe them as what the, my god like they did not bathe for years they they literally muslims said you can know that an, a frankish army is coming before you see them from the stench you would smell them you, you smell them oh they're coming right they stink you know Fra french the france right perfumes france is known for what perfumes you know why did they use perfume instead of washing they hide it right it's it's and one thing that happened epidemics spread crazy among them they lost so many people because of uncleanliness they, they no hygiene they don't use water they go to the bathroom they don't it's crazy they don't bath you know so it was to muslims felt so utter yeah co in comparison the army of salah al-din had mobile bathrooms you're a muslim you have to be clean you have to make ghusl you have to make wudu so it's an army you have mobile bathrooms you have to take a shower you know comparatively the, the franks were so backward the only thing they were good at and this is what muslims said they said they are good in one thing when it comes to the battlefield when it comes to bravery when it comes to the determination when it comes to you know they are excellent their sense of thabat steadfastness their stand of you know they can sacrifice like no tomorrow their grit is so powerful but their ilm their knowledge their science their hygiene their their, their logic is laughable so they view them as animals literally like, like barbarians the only good thing about them is they fight well that's it right this was the image of the franks as seen by the muslims of the time now what will happen how will things change how will the tide change who are the people that led to this inshallah that's what we find out inshallah next time inshallah next week so we'll stop here inshallah and uh, please uh, feel free to come and uh, try whatever you want inshallah here jazakumullah khair subhanak allahumma wa bihamdik la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik jazakumullah khair which you want the armor or you want the